Yeah, so we were discussing about uh, major types of wear mechanisms and uh, we had discussed abrasive wear and one thing is important abrasive wear takes place by hard asperity so one of the surface must be high, hard so hard means hardness should be high and another the second surface can be soft as well as hard it can happen between two both hard surfaces or between hard and soft surfaces um, the stresses will be high so for example uh, hard surface with some roughness so if this is one asperity and this surface is let's say small uh, soft and this is hard asperity so what will happen is this asperity will easily dig into the soft material and as there is a motion here it will do the plastic deformation and material removal okay so therefore on the surface you will find very long scratches going from one end to another and these scratches can be quite deep or sometimes shallow um, abrasive marks can also be seen so it involves fracture and plastic deformation so plastic deformation is like this and if this is also hard if the second surface is also hard then obviously plastic deformation will be limited so here basically some particles will come out because of the fracture so at this level at the contact level both plastic deformation and fracture are taking place and relative hardness is important but as I said it can happen between hard and soft as well as between hard and hard surfaces and scratching or gouging these are the terms used for very um, mild one we call it a scratching and for deeper one we call it gouging so this is quite well established and uh, the hardness generally if you have got harder material then you can expect abrasive wear so for example diamond or boron carbide uh, silicon carbide uh, silicon oxide so silicon oxide is quartz or uh, sand particles garnet so these are typical hard materials but also in the metals we have got hard martensite martensitic steel so this uh, abrasive wear follows Archer's law quite closely so this is uh, one thing that we should know and this also follows Archer's law so in the industry 50% of wear failure happens by abrasive wear so this is very very common and often it happens because of uh, dust dust uh, particles also debris particles so debris particles tend to be oxides right so for example if uh, iron uh, if uh, steel is involved then steel will form different oxides FeO, Fe2O3 and so on so these oxides tend to be very hard particles and therefore wear debris become harder after getting oxidized and this will lead to uh, abrasive wear so as we were discussing the solution for abrasive wear <clears throat> in the case of IC engines we have uh, oil filtering so oil filtering is is very very important so no matter how much lubrication we use there will always be some uh, wear abrasive wear 
<coughs> and uh, <coughs> if we let these abrasive particles go back into the engine or um, goes into the between the cylinder and the piston or other parts of the engine then the wear will be very very fast and therefore it is very important that we do the oil filtering very carefully as well as we do the oil change because after some time this oil will become so dirty that you you cannot live with that kind of oil so you must do the oil change <clears throat> then all kinds of bearings are sealed so for example if this is the ball bearing so all ball bearings are sealed in the inner side here using seals so this is also to protect it from any dust particles because if dust particles will go inside it will just lead to accelerated wear <clears throat> the next uh, is adhesive wear so these terminologies are sometimes used quite uh, loosely but it is important that we understand exactly what is causing abrasive wear and what is causing adhesive wear because all the tribological solutions solutions can be found from these um, these failure marks whatever failure marks you see so ma mainly a result of adhesion between the interacting surfaces so if interacting asperities like for example here asperity 1 and asperity 2 so they are interacting with each other and they are in contact here this is the contact point contact surface okay so <clears throat> but they will adhere so strongly here that the failure when it is passing through this when they are sliding the failure doesn't take place here but it goes inside inside of them and therefore this chunk of material can be removed because of adhesive wear so adhesion level is high if the adhesion level is high severe detachment can lead to tearing of the microscopic chunks so these are quite big chunks of material so macroscopic chunks of materials are removed so adhesive wear often happens between similar materials similar materials if we are talking about mostly metals then for example ferrous and ferrous sorry So therefore, it is important that one of the pair must be a different material. So the two terms are used, galling and scuffing. So when you, in the industry, when you talk about wear, people don't say it is failing by adhesive wear. Adhesive is the mechanism, but the mode, mode of failure, they call it galling or scuffing. So scuffing is used when uh, in the beginning when lubricant fails so failure of the lubricant can lead to scuffing and when it is much more severe than it is galling so, so the reason for adhesive wear could be bad material selection for example we talked about this one or it can be lubricant failure so when the lubricant fails in the bearing it can lead to uh, adhesive wear or it can also be a result of temperature rise because temperature rise will lead to reduction in the the mechanical property especially the yield strength so that means the material will become soft and very 
easy to adhere to each other. So in this analysis, uh, a very very uh, rough analysis it is. So sliding distance 2a, so for example if this is 2a, the wear volume is given by this. Okay? So this is just the volume of this hemispherical particle. So if we consider wear particle as this hemispherical instead of this kind of shape, then we can give this as the volume and volume per unit sliding distance is, is this one divided by 2a which is equal to here. And if we write the applied normal load in terms of hardness then we can write hardness multiplied by pi a square okay? because hardness is basically load divided by the contact area, projected contact area. So and joining these two equations together we can find out this one and this will also lead to wear coefficient as 1.1 1 .1 over 3. So this, this w, small w is wear volume per unit sliding distance. So this tells us that uh, wear coefficient for adhesive wear is fixed or constant but again in reality it is not constant it is and it is much less than unity so so this analysis only gives us certain ideas that how the wear coefficient can be calculated but actual wear coefficient will be uh, different these examples for example here in a uh, uh, bolt this material has been removed here and if you look at the adhesive worn out surfaces the surface which has worn out by adhesive wear you will see this kind of chunks of large chunks of material coming out so this is a ACM picture scanning electron microscope picture so yeah sir can we say that uh, two different materials makes adhesive bond and when uh, once the sliding starts due to this bonds going to rupture and it is called a uh, wear um, yes the bond is what you said they form the bond between the two surfaces so this bond is is easy to form when you have got both as soft surf, soft material or ductile material so for example ductile material if they are soft or similar material when they are similar material there will be very strong interact interatomic attraction between them and because of this the bond will form so yes the bond will form at atomic scale okay so atom to atom bonds will take place bonds will be formed and these are not the chemical bonds, these are the more physical bonds or van der Waals forces. And when they are in relative sliding, obviously detachment will take place. So adhesion and then detachment. This is the mechanism. Leads to and detachment. So when the detachment takes place, that detachment will not take place along this line, along the interface the detachment will take place on another another place okay and therefore a chunk of material will be removed so that is yeah it's uh, mainly from ir irregularity in surfaces uh, because uh, the wear debris has to come worn out so from uh, one of the reason due to irregularity uh, they come in contact and uh, uh, soft material gets one of another reason may be the possibility due to the disadhesion in bone mm -hmm. yes so um, yes after this process irregularities will happen and the roughness of the surface will will increase so obviously the material will be removed so it will look very very rough and lot of uh, material has been removed from the surface so 
uh, adhesive wear really leads to a very um, a situation when the wear rate can be can increase very high okay and when it is extreme level then uh, galling and seizure may happen so for example an ic engine uh, the piston and cylinder can lead to seizure when the temperature goes high okay because because of high temperature uh -huh. uh, the materials become soft and therefore the adhesion is higher okay so soft materials are more ductile i'm talking about the metals and the contact area will also increase so this the whole process will lead to seizure of the two surfaces that means they completely fail they uh, completely adhere to each other okay. so that is uh, the worst case of uh, adhesive wear another thing we should know about is sometimes these uh, adhesive wear particles may be in the rolled form and this roll form is because of the rolling that takes place between uh, so for example once the wear debris has come out and now the wear debris is still soft because of uh, high temperature and uh, this is sliding between two surfaces so these wear debris particles will start rolling and they will look like a cylindrical particles okay. so this also an indicator that adhesive wear was taking place because the particles are soft in nature and then they rolled so this happened after the wear after the wear process that means after the removal of the material and then they change in the shape like this so this is also an indicator and we should know how it was formed so a lot of uh, study is done uh, after the wear failure and then we find out the what will be the solution okay. that is how we can improve our uh, design so next type of uh, wear i would like to talk is called delamination wear again as you could know uh, as you see that these terms are being used um, very specifically for certain mechanism okay. so we should know about this uh, these terminology and what they mean only then we can solve the problems so delamination wear is removal of materials in thin flakes or platelets this occurs due to high shear and some plastic deformation every contact cycle okay. so when so when two surfaces are sliding against each other and let's say the friction is high but maybe not too high in the range of 0.3 friction coefficient so in this kind of situation uh, in the subsurface some stresses will be created and we will discuss the fatigue wear also where we will talk more about this one so this is also kind of fatigue process so shear stress shear stress is high in the subsurface beneath the surface okay at the surface we have got the contact uh, load and there is a normal stress but the shear stress is little bit down inside and if this material has got some defects defects such as uh, um, maybe impurities in metals impurities or in metals you might have also uh, studied about vacancies or even uh, vacancies and even voids for large defects so if 
you have these kind of defects here and the shear stress is high then here there is a good chance that fracture will initiate and the, the crack will initiate and grow in all directions okay especially it grows towards the surface and let's say there is another crack growing here and they will all meet together so by doing this it will remove this a small piece of material from here and so we call it delamination when this um, piece of wear debris is in the form of flakes or platelets so and uh, it happens because of the shear stress which is also caused by the the frictional stress so frictional stress is also a shear stress on the surface okay so a combination of frictional stress and the normal stress will cause this uh, delamination wear and when mu is beyond 0 0.3 this will lead to more severe cases and then the mode of uh, wear will change from delamination to some other okay so this will lead to severe wear so if we want to protect the surfaces we we should never reach this kind of coefficient of friction so since it is taking place in the subsurface because of the shear stress we can say that uh, delamination wear can happen even without, uh, even with well lubricated surfaces. So, even with good lubrication, we, delamination wear can still happen because it is initiated in the subsurface. Lubrication only changes the situation at the counter, at the interface but it is happening at the subsurface where lubricant is not present. So even uh, with good lubrication, delamination wear can take place. Uh, the next is uh, fatigue wear. So fatigue wear in some way is similar to delamination wear, but this is in a much more, uh, um, because of much higher stress which but with the presence of lubricated surfaces in rolling contacts due to repeated surface stress reversals so for example if we have got a ball rolling on a surface so even though there is no sliding it's a pure rolling condition the stresses will vary. So for example, here, uh, there is something called uh, Hergian contact, right? So if, although in a ball bearing, the contact surface is elliptical in nature, but if we just do a simple analysis of sphere on a flat surface, then we can give the stress profile as parabolic like this this is the contact radius so this is the contact and for ball and flat plate the contact will be a circle and so from a to minus a so if we divide by the contact radius then we can say 1 to minus 1 So here you will see that the normal stress profile. So this is normal stress profile if the mean pressure is zero, a P, P naught, okay. You can see the normal stress profile, um, but also there is a stress in the radial direction which is causing here, just because of the static contact, 
which goes from compressive to tensile like this. So this is compressive stress. And the radial stress is the form of tensile stress here. And in addition to this, in the subsurface, in Z direction, if we call it, uh, for example, if we normalize by A, Z over A, so in the subsurface, there will be shear stress. And the value of shear stress will vary something like this. So this is the magnitude and this is the maximum shear stress. So shear stress happens because of the complex stress state and there, is a, there are principal stresses here and therefore that leads to shear stress. So this shear stress happens at a point which is um, 0.48 A. So this is the distance from here the center of the contact. So at this point it will be maximum 0.48 and the value of shear stress is given as 0.3 P naught. P naught is the mean pressure. So we can see that because of this shear stress in the subsurface the material is under high stress so as this ball rolls, so let's say this ball, because of this ball rolling, this surface is coming and going inside, right? So as it comes, it experiences uh, normal stress. Then at some point, it experiences shear stress. Again, normal compressive stress, okay? Uh, as well as on the surface it experiences the tensile stress. So all these kind of situation will lead to crack initiation. Crack initiation in the subsurface. So this crack is happening despite good lubrication. So even if there is a good lubrication, still this crack initiation will happen because good lubrication can only reduce the shear stress acting on the surface. But because of the load, we have shear stress in the subsurface. And this is what is uh, leading to fatigue wear or pitting. And since this is rolling on a track, if we just consider, then this is rolling that means stress is always coming and going back this way so because of this uh, repeated stress reversal fatigue will take place so fatigue is the process which uh, happens because of the stress reversal and in this kind of the surface fatigue is different from the normal fatigue because in normal fatigue process we have a what is called fatigue limit you might have studied about fatigue limit you know what is fatigue limit Do you remember what is fatigue limit? Uh, so fatigue limit is the yes fatigue uh, is the stress uh, at which the life of the component or machine element will be infinite. Yes, sir. 10 to the power 3, more than 10. No, 10 to the power uh, more than 8. 6. six. Yeah. 10 to the power 3 is not considered as, as very large. So, when it is more than 10 to the power 8, then we call it almost infinite. 
infinite life. So this is the fatigue limit. So for a normal uh, material uh, or normal machine element, we can give a fatigue limit. So if we, during the design process, if we uh, take care of the fatigue strength of the material, well, fatigue limit, we call it when it is infinite, actual infinite. That means the material is not going to fail by fatigue. But fatigue strength is the stress at which the fatigue life is 10 to the power 8. Okay? So that is the difference between fatigue limit and fatigue strength. So as long as we keep the stress low, by our design process, uh, we can avoid fatigue uh, for a normal machine element. But if it is a surface fatigue, then there is no such fatigue limit. So for surface fatigue, uh, no fatigue limit. That means it will fail by fatigue no matter what is the stress value. So obviously for bearings, the stresses will be quite high and especially in non conformal contexts. So the fatigue will take place uh, whatever is the stress situation. So, so fatigue failure is very, very common for uh, rolling element bearing and this is known as fatigue wear. <clears throat> so fatigue wear uh, is is different from abrasion, abrasive wear or adhesive wear. So here we do not uh, find out fatigue, co uh, fatigue wear coefficient. We cannot call it like this because once the crack initiates and once the pit has been formed, that is the end of this surface because now this wear particle will actually become the third body and therefore it will even increase the wear process. This becomes third body. So actually the removal of the material and formation of pit, even one single pit is considered as uh, the life or so therefore we do not go for finding out the wear coefficient in that in this case, we have fatigue life, but the process is by wear process, fatigue life. So we can find out the fatigue life and uh, some people have given some models. One is given like this. As you know, many of, many of the fatigue um, equations or models are mostly empirical in nature because it is very difficult to relate with any kind of analytic, analytical model so we use this kind of equation so where L10 is life fatigue life in millions millions of revolution so inside a bearing obviously the ball is for example revolving here inside going from here to here so so we count the number of revolutions so this is the millions this many millions of cycle and lf is <coughs> is a life factor so life fac factor is like a material constant and small p is the exponent uh, load life exponent Okay, and uh, 
sees the theoretical load that a bearing can carry for a life of one million in a race devolution. So C is the theoretical load for the life of one million and P is the actual load. So let's say we apply certain load P and if we know the load life exponent P and LF and C then we can calculate the total life of this bearing. So this is how the bearing uh, fatigue life of a bearing is given and these values are actually provided. So for example this value life factor is given in standard uh, STLE standards. So STLE is a society is called Society of Tribology and Lubrication Engineers. So STLE provides uh, these values. So for example LF of AISI 52100 sorry 00 so this is a very very uh, popular bearing steel so this steel is often used for all the bearing uh, components bearing balls and inner rays and outer rays so the LF for this is given as 3. So that means if the LF life factor is less than 3 that means it's not a good bearing material and there is a, another bearing uh, steel which is even better than this one is AMS 6278 M50 NIL this is a nickel grade uh, with nickel and chromium. So this steel has got LF of 4. So this is very good bearing steel. But normal practice, in normal practice we use this steel. Okay. So if we know these uh, properties, then we can find out the fatigue life of a bearing. So that means for fatigue wear, we do not calculate as wear coefficient. We calculate as the fatigue life of a bearing using this analysis. And this analysis is basically through empirical means, through experiments and empirical relation. Okay. So, the fatigue wear will take place in all kinds of rolling bearing, uh, rolling element bearings, for example, ball bearings or uh, roller bearings. And even though we have uh, bearings which are designed with very good materials, good lubrication, and since friction is, is low, therefore the temperature is also not much. it can go into range of 200 degrees Celsius. But despite this, the fatigue failure will happen for the bearings. So, okay, so here we will stop.